public lecture given by University of Miami professor Keir Becker on the contributions of Scripps' deep sea drilling project to the theory of plate tectonics. Professor Becker's, or as like, I like to call him dad's, <laughs> research focuses principally on heat flow and hydrothermal circulation in the oceanic crust, as well as the implementation and maintenance of borehole hydrogeological observatories. After graduating from Harvard, he arrived at Scripps in 1976 to pursue a PhD with Vic Bacchier and Leroy Dorman. He then stayed at Scripps for another three and a half years as an assistant research geophysicist for the deep sea drilling project. In 1985, Professor Becker moved back to the East Coast and joined the faculty of the University of Miami's Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. Over the course of his career, he has spent about six years at sea, participated in at least 35 Alvin dives, and served on or chaired numerous committees on scientific drilling. Before I turn the microphone over to Professor Becker, though I already did this, I already revealed that he's my father. <laughs> surfing park, eating avocados every day, and of course, doing science were critical to my own decision to pursue my PhD here at Scripps. Without further ado, it is my honor to introduce my father, Peter Becker. Thanks so much, my goodness. <laughs> it reminds me of what, two and a half years ago, driving from Miami to San Diego to bring my app here for graduate school. 39 years after I made the same product. So it's, it's actually quite hard work. Thanks. I'd also like to thank uh, John Slater and the students who organized this symposium for inviting me to come here. Um, I'm not quite sure why I was selected as the evening speaker, um, but let me start, um, introduce myself a little bit. Um, I came here in 1976. So that's approximately 10 years after plate tectonics was developed. So I'm in the second or third generation of scientists working on plate tectonics problems. So not one of the originals, like we have so many distinguished examples in the room. Um, I was a shipboard scientist on 21 expeditions of scientific ocean drilling, starting in 1979 when I was a graduate student. And as recently as January, February this year. I think the 21 is a world record for a scientist. Um, and coach you signed this five times. That's not a world record. Um, and I'm also well known as a co-originator of this ODP, IODP, so-called Cork Long-Term Hydrogeological Observatory that's now been deployed in over 30 seaport boreholes around the world since 1991. So we'll spend a few minutes in this talk describing some of those results as well, even though it has nothing to do with tectonics really. <laughs> um, so there I was, 1981, I, I used this picture for the flyer for this evening because that was the year I got my PhD here, and uh, it's kind of in honor of the graduate students here who, who invited me here. I was just several weeks after turning in my written dissertation and getting my degree. <clears throat> that was my third expedition. I had done two as a graduate student. So one of my punchlines here is to encourage every graduate student, if you ever get an opportunity to sail on IODP now, you must take it. It's just a, you cannot <clears throat> uh, forego that opportunity. <clears throat> All right, so one minute. The title of the talk is Plate Tectonics Contributions of the Deep Sea Drilling Project at Scripps. Um, I'm going to start, actually, uh, it's also the 50th anniversary of the Deep Sea Drilling Project. 50th anniversary of Plate Tectonics, 50th anniversary of DSDP. Some people call it the 50th anniversary of scientific ocean drilling, but that is not true. That started at least uh, basically 11 years before DSDP. I'm going to go through some of that history, Project Mohole, then go through Joides and DSDP. Um, very selective. A uh, couple of contributions of scripts in the deep sea drilling <coughs> project with respect to plate tectonics. At that point, the talk is going to devolve, and I hope you won't <coughs> deteriorate into basically my own personal record reminiscences about scientific <laughs> ocean drilling. Um, so, scripts, luminaries, and DSDP, a brief overview of 
a follow-on OSHA drilling program called ODP, which went for 20 years, and the current IODP, which has gone from 2003 to the present. And then I'll, a few words about the long-term four holders. <coughs> I also want to acknowledge this great website, scripshistory.ucsd.edu, which was put together um, by the retired scripts library, I understand. Um, and I'm going to show you a movie clip which I found on that site and some, some pictures and things like that. Alright, so let's go straight to the origin. Uh, this is described in a, a formal proposal submitted by something called AMSOC, a wonderful name, and I'll explain that in a couple minutes, um, to drill a hole to the mobile Mohorichik discontinuity. And this is the actual text from the proposal. It, uh, it's a historical proof that, like many good ideas in oceanography, it was first proposed by uh, one of the most famous names in Scripps history, Walter Monk, who's honored us with his presence tonight. <laughs> so let me just read this for a second. Uh, it was actually written by Harry Hess, whose name has come up many times. Um, the end of discontinuity is that between the Earth's crust and the mantle. It is found at about 35 kilometers under the continents, but maybe as close as 4 kilometers under the seafloor. History of the project. At a meeting of the Earth Sciences Panel of the National Science Foundation in March 1957, Dr. Walter Monk suggested that we should consider what project, regardless of cost, would do the most to open up new avenues of research and suggested that a sample of the mantle would be the single most significant item. The project to drill a hole and get such a sample was thus born. The present writer strongly favored Monk's idea and suggested referring it to the wonderfully named American Miscellaneous Society. I'll explain that except for action. This was done and a meeting was held in California in April to discuss the proposal. The lore is that was a breakfast wine meeting at Walter Monk's house. <laughs> and so no, no wonder it was enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, a couple paragraphs later, this very bold statement about the American Miscellaneous Society. It has no officers, no constitution, no bylaws, and consequently can act expeditiously and without red tape when action is appropriate. It is an organization which warrants respect. <laughs> and here's a picture of a meeting of the AMSOC in DC at some point. Uh, that's Roger Rebell right there, and I believe that's Harry Hess uh, sitting to his left. Um, it was originally organized in 1952 by the Office of Naval Research to advise them on scientific issues for which there was no precedent or, or uh, uh, other way of getting, <laughs> getting advice. Um, AMSOC formed a mobile committee chaired by Gordon Mill of ONR, and original members included Roger Rebell and Walter Monk of Scripps. <coughs> Willard Bascom, who had at one point a position at Scripps, was appointed as the mobile technical director. So the aim was ultimately to drill through the oceanic crust and retrieve samples of the mantle where it was close to the surface. Uh, it actually conducted only one phase of experimental drilling and barely got into the salts beneath the sediments. So this has been a long-standing goal of the time of the drilling for, what is it, 61 years, and it's still a prime objective of the current drilling program. Um, well, that phase one experimental drilling was conducted in 1961 using the Cold Marine vessel CUS-1, where CUS stood for the initials of four oil companies that had uh, collectively converted this barge to a drilling vessel uh, at a site offshore uh, Guadalupe Island near Baja, California. It had very strong scripts participation at sea including the lead scientist Bill Rito, Walter Sale, Roger Ravel Sale, Gustavo Arrhenius, and a young scientist named Dick von Herzog, whose name we've heard today. Uh, he got his PhD the year before at Scripps. Um, there was a lot of political maneuvering to try and 
uh, build a new ship to do the ultimate mobile drilling, and eventually it was killed by Congress in 1966, thanks to escalating cost estimates and competing bids and a bunch of DC politics. Uh, scientific contribution was the first subsea samples of the basaltic, so-called second layer at that time, and a big important technical contribution demonstrated the feasibility of deep ocean scientific drilling and developed dynamic position, which is pretty standard for most oceanographic ships now. They did that by attaching four huge outboard motors onto the sides of the vessel, two on each side, and uh, they were controlled by a, a really very crude computer that uh, operated with a central choice and drive the ship sideways to keep the position so they had to keep the drill, drill string over the site. Um, it's also famous for a John Steinbeck article in Life magazine. Huge public in outreach and interest. He actually sailed on the expedition. And little known, there's a very important congratulatory telegram for phase one from President John F. Kennedy. So I'm going to show that as well. Um, Willard Bascom actually wrote a book about this called Hole in the Bottom of the Sea in 1961, and this is a figure from his book illustrating uh, basically the objective, a hole from uh, sea surface all the way down through this basaltic <coughs> second layer into the mantle. And the point of this figure is that the deepest oil well at the time was about 25,000 feet, and this target was going to be about 33,000 feet. So was not that big of a technological goal, apparently, in terms of drilling capabilities. But it's just putting those capabilities onto a floating platform. Here's the site up there. They poured through 170 meters of sediments and actually 13 meters into this so-called second layer. And here's some photos from on board from the John Steinbeck article, that's Steinbeck himself on, on the rig floor. Um, my own father was a novelist, so I appreciate this a lot. And, uh, pictures of there's Roger Rodell, Walter Monk, Gustavo Reyes, that's Willard Bascom, and that's also Willard Bascom. Uh, here's Bill Regal, there's the ship, here's Walter Monk. Actually, hands on, pulling out the core. It's really amazing to see that. So, all of us oceanographers really like to do the hands-on and see the stuff. And here's one of their core samples of the second layer of salt. And there's actually a nice couple of nice movies. One's about, about 20 minutes you can find on the Scripps History uh, website. This is a short one. It's supposed to have sound, but there may be some technical difficulties in getting the sound.
Success of just sampling the subsea floor <coughs> the salt, second layer, so called second layer, actually inspired this congratulatory telegram from President John F. Kennedy and uh, 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 Xerox of it there. And I'm going to read it to you uh, to emphasize the contrast uh, to what comes out of Washington these days about science. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I have been following with deep interest the experimental drilling in conjunction with the first phase of Project Noble. The success of the drilling in almost 12,000 feet of water near Guadalupe Island and the penetration of the oceanic crust down to the volcanic formations constitute a remarkable achievement and an historic landmark in our scientific and engineering progress. The people of the United States can take pride not only in the accomplishment, but in the fact that they have supported this basic scientific exploration. I extend to you my congratulations and ask that you pass them on to the Special Committee and the staff of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Science Foundation, the Global Marine Exploration Company, and especially to all those on board the CUS-1 and attendant vessels who have combined their talents and energies to achieve this major success. <clears throat> all right, so as I mentioned, this didn't really develop any further. Funding was killed off uh, five years later in 1966. In 1962 and 1963, there were several attempts by subsets of the organizations who were involved in AMSOC to organize uh, efforts to continue scientific ocean drilling using some kind of an intermediate vessel. There was something called LOCO, which stood for Long Cores in the Atlantic and Caribbean Sea. Um, something called Associated Oceanographic Institutions, and then something called a Consortium for Oceanic Research and Exploration. Uh, none of those really got very far. Far there was a single expedition of local prototype drilling proposed by Cesare Emiliani from the University of Miami. Um, but finally, in 1964, something took hold that lasted, and that was the formation of Joides that led to the Deep Sea Journal Project. Joides was formed in 1964 by a memorandum of, under, of agreement signed by the directors of four institutions, uh, F.G. Walton Smith from the Institute for Marine Sciences, which is now my own institution, Erasmus, uh, Morris Ewing from the Lamont Geological Observatory, which is now the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, Roger Abel from Scripps, and Paul Fye from Woods Hole. Physical scientists of the institutions believe that basic oceanographic research has a pressing need to investigate the ocean floors through the laboratory examination of samples obtained from considerable depths below the bottom. The directors of the institutions unanimously agree that this direction of research has a high probability of being rewarded. They also recognize that it is desirable to set up a cooperative joint effort to obtain financial support for, to plan for, and to carry out such a program. The project will be termed the Joint Oceanographic Institution's Deep Earth Sampling Program, and that's the origin of the name Joides. The first Joides project was actually in 1965, before deep sea drilling. That was coring by a vessel called Caldrill One on the Blake Plateau offshore of the Carolinas, with Lamont as the operating institution. The DSDP was going to be the second Joides project, originally planned for only 18 months. Scripps was selected in 1966 as the operating institution, and that included oversight of the 1967-1968 construction of the new drill ship, Glomar Challenger. There. 
So right away, DSTP uh, went out and proved basic tenet of plate tectonics, C4 mm -hmm. spreading. Um, the third leg um, directly verified C4 spreading in 1969 with the co-chief scientists were Art Maxwell, from which all the time Dick von Herzen, um, who had been at Scripps, the graduate student at Scripps in 1960, had been there for eight years and had moved to Woods Hole by that point. They basically cored uh, all the way to basement in a series of sites across the South Atlantic from the Mid Atlantic Ridge, the spreading center, and dated the basal sediments. And those made a nice linear relationship with distance from the Mid Atlantic Ridge, basically proving C4 spreading. DSDP originally was intended for 18 months. It got extended multiple times. It ended up lasting 15 years. The Glomar Challenger sailed on 96 so-called legs, about two months long, uh, for exploratory drilling throughout the world oceans at 624 sites. This provided further proof of plate tectonics and that the ages of the sediments and basements at all of those sites were no greater than about 170 million years. Um, as Dan Carrick mentioned earlier today, that there was some people thought some sites in the Western Pacific were, were Paleozoic in nature. There were some people at the time, even after plate tectonics was, was accepted, still thought that somewhere in the oceans we would find a billion year old foundered crust of some sort, and we never did. So that, that's, uh, again, proving plate tectonics. All the, the ocean basins are all, all, all young. Um, it documented the plate tectonic origins of many features throughout the oceans, uh, from the subduction zones to spreading centers, um, hotspot traces, things like that. The Scripps impact was particularly strong in the early days of DSDP in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, where the Kochi sinus from Scripps read like a who's who of marine geology of Scripps at the time. Uh, Mel Peterson, Terry Edgar, Jerry Winter, Bill Riedel, John Slater, R.L. Fisher, who has been around since Bob here tonight. Um, Joe Curry, Dave Moore, Bill Menard, even at the end of DSTP. Um, and Jerry Winter, the legendary Jerry Winter, was a coach of science of six expeditions, four in DSTP and two in ODP. I think that's the world record. So, I'm just going to do a couple of highlights with respect to plate tectonics. Um, DSTP actually cored some of the Hawaii Emperor Seamounts to try and verify a fixed hotspot hypothesis for the, for the formation of the Hawaiian Islands. Um, Dan McKenzie mentioned this briefly today. Um, the hypothesis had been developed by J. Tuzo Wilson and especially Jason Morgan in 1972 that the Hawaiian Island Emperor Seamount chain was formed as the Pacific Plate passed over a fixed Hawaiian hotspot boom that originated from much deeper continental <coughs> than the plate itself. And this, this is Hawaiian islands. You know, this illustrates the concept that the plate is moving approximately northwestward across this fixed hotspot. And so each of the Hawaiian islands, as you approach that hotspot, is younger and younger. That can be extended throughout the Hawaiian uh, island chain and the Emperor Seamount chain but there's this notorious sharp bend at about 43 million years. And that implied a direction <coughs> of Pacific plate motion over the hot spot at about 43 million years ago. So DSDP cored some of those emperor sea mounts um, to test that hypothesis by determining the paleomagnetic inclinations of the basalt flows that form the sea mounts. I will go through the technical details you have to get a number of samples and some for a statistically reliable measurement of the magnetic inclination at which the basalts were formed. The results seem mostly consistent with the fixed hotspot hypothesis, but if you read the reports carefully, there was a suggestion of some south erosion <coughs> of the hotspot, especially since the formation of the Suico uh, seamount about 65 million years ago. Later, ODP added some more sites 
and demonstrated a much more significant southward motion of the hot spot during the formation of the Emperor Seamounts over the 43 million years. So that the conclusion was that that hot spot was actually not fixed before 43 million years ago, and you don't need a big shift in the Pacific plate motion to account for the bend in the uh, seamount chain. Now, Odie Eilerke also cored a similar study in the Louisville seamount chain uh, in the southwestern Pacific. They found that that particular hotspot seemed to be fixed in position. So there's some of the hotspots seem to be fixed, some may not. Um, two, two key DSTP tech, technological contributions. Um, dynamic re, uh, positioning and reentry. Dynamic positioning had been developed for Project Mobile, where you uh, had some beacons on the seafloor, some thrusters on the ship, and you used the acoustic ranging to keep the ship in position so that you didn't bend the drill string when if you ship, if the ship moved a little bit. Reentry involves putting an infrastructure on the seafloor so that you can actually pull, drill some, come out, change your bit, go back in and keep drilling. That was developed by Scripps, uh, DSTP and Scripps. Um, the vast majority of the holes drilled by DSTP, ODP, and IODP don't involve this kind of reentry coming. About 100 to 150 have been so called reentry holes. The other big technological contribution was development of uh, what's called the hydraulic piston core, which is the technological workhouse for the science of paleo-oceanography. This is a, it was first used on Lake 64 with Scripps co-chiefs uh, Joe Curry, Dave Moore. Uh, this is a figure from that original uh, use. It basically uses hydraulic pressure to uh, pressure up until you shear some shear pins and the core barrel basically shoots out with great force and it has almost perfect recovery. And this is an example from the very first use in, in the Guaymas Basin uh, where you can clearly see alternating dark and light layers which in that case represented annual cycles of productivity. So each light dark uh, couplet there represents a single year of paleoceanographic history. So, and now ODP and IODP have extended the depth range of this tool, so it now yield, yields nearly perfect recovery down to greater than 400 meters. And again, it's a real technological workhouse for, workhorse for the science of heavy motion. All right. So one other highlight that I was involved personally, um, basically DSDP started uh, determining, uh, resolving structure within this mysterious second layer, otherwise known as layer two by the seismologists. Uh, starting in the mid-70s, DSDP made a concerted effort to core deep into the basaltic second layer to several sites in the Atlantic and eastern Pacific. At that time, seismologists had actually identified sublayers, such as 2A, 2B, and 2C, and geologists had inferred from on land both devices that the boundary between layers 2 and 3 might represent the rock lithological boundary between basalts and gatherers. During Leg 83, with co chief scientists Jose Honore and, and Roger Anderson, DSD penetrated for the first time through the, through the extrusive basalts and deep into the underlying intrusive dikes in Hole 504. And they're shown here inspecting a pipe that broke during this process, but luckily the drillers were able to fish out what was left in the hole. This happened two or three, but maybe four times during the play. Uh, and so this result, this was such a breakthrough, it resulted in this nature full-length article in 1982, which Roger was the lead author for, um, and it's also where I was running this experiment from that picture. That's a basically an electrode that we, it's a very simple kind of experiment. We put four electrodes spaced uh, over about 100 to 150 meters on a cable with an uh, a electrode for a source at beneath them. We put from the ship 
We lowered this into the hole and applied something like 600 volts and 6 amps of current into the formation and measured the voltage. That, if you're wondering, that is enough to electrocute yourself. Yeah. Luckily, it didn't happen. <laughs> um, and so then by a simple-minded, uh, sim the simplest kind of transform between resistivity and porosity, we could deduce the porosity structure and it nicely lined up with the seismic structure, layer 2A, 2B, 2C. So that also got a, a nature art. I think that's the first time, maybe the only time, drilling projects has had back-to-back, -back, full length nature articles. All right, so now, we, now we're going to really deteriorate into, into a picture show here. Uh, some scenes from DSDP. On the left, we have the roughnecks running the pipe on the rig floor using these massive tongs, they're called. Um, nowadays, everything is, almost everything done is with robotic iron roughnecks. Um, the old timers on the ship, the Glomar Challenger, all were missing a part of at least one finger just because of the dangers of doing this. On the right, we have a typical technician next to the rig floor, kind of reminiscent of Dan's uh, picture this morning. Uh, their uniform was uh, flip flops, uh, barely shorts, uh, no hard hats, and they're, they're throwing around huge wrenches and everything working on these tools. Luckily, none of them lost any parts of their toes, but nowadays you can't get anywhere close to the rig floor like this without a hard hat, safety glasses, steel toe boots, and some ships, some of the drill ships, full, uh, full uh, jumpsuit. So this guy is, is probably the most famous technician in all of scientific ocean drilling, Gus, Ted Gustafson. Um, he retired a couple of years ago, but he's probably sailed about a hundred expeditions all time. All right, some more pictures. Scripps leadership in DSDP and ODP jib come up one and four fluid studies. Um, and I'm glad to see that both Yoris and Miriam are with us tonight. Um, we have Scripps' Yoris Giskis, Chemistry Tech Jim Pine, and Jacques Boulay on, on Lake 92 down in the chemistry lab, and then Roy Davis, who I know has some friends in the audience, um, and Miriam Castor on leg 92 also, sampling uh, fluids from old 504B, actually. And there's a nice story here. The chemistry lab was down on the lowest level of the Challenger lab stack. You really got down there, unless you were doing chemistry, but every time I went down there, these guys were always smiling. <laughs> and the reason is, at the beginning of each expedition, all the uh, great cans of grape juice would disappear from the gallery. <laughs> and by the end of the expedition, it had been turned into uh, fine pine wine. <laughs> all right, and the first few years of DSTP and Oxy Mobile were all uh, purely U.S. projects, but uh, Starting in 1993 and 1974, under what's called the International Phase of Ocean Drilling of DSDP, international partners were added. The program has been international ever since, um, and it's often highlighted as a premier, if not the premier, example of international scientific collaboration. Just, and so all of us who participated in that made, made numerous contacts, worldwide contacts, and those have really essentially made our careers in a way. And just one example, uh, Hajimu or Jimmy Kenosha, who was actually my roommate on Leg 83 in 1981, and later became an executive director of JAMSEC. He's been a lifelong colleague and friend. In fact, in 12 days, I'm going to have dinner with him in Japan. All right, moving to ODP. Quick, quick summary of ODP. Uh, that lasted, did drilling from 1985 to 2003. It was also international, about two-thirds of the funding came from the National Science Foundation. The rest came from uh, multiple international partners, each contributing something like two to three million dollars annually. Uh, here's the Droidies resolution, that ship that they, they used. Uh, it, had been, it was a converted oil field drill ship that had been built only a couple years earlier. 
Uh, that's in the Panama Canal. It's now painted blue and has been quite uh, extensively remodeled. What's important is DSTP was explored, basically exploring all the world's oceans. The ODP emphasized thematic <coughs> planning. The legs were based on proposals that were submitted by the scientific community to address themes that were set out in periodic long-range plans, like this 1996 to 2003 uh, final long-range plan for ODP. A few selected ODP highlights. Uh, define the long-term record of Earth's natural climate variability using that tool, the hydraulic piston core. They call it the advanced piston core. Um, recover the best submarine cores that we have at the KT, Cretaceous, Tertiary, or I guess we should have to call it Cretaceous Paleogene now, uh, impact path. Successfully sampled seafloor gas hydrates for the first time. Cored and logged nearly two kilometers into the oceanic crust in whole 5 for b and established a new reference hole, 1256D, in fast spread across. And I forgot to say earlier that both of those holes debunked the theory that the layer 2 3 boundary is the lithological boundary between basalts and gamboes. Um, Cored through plate boundary faults at several type examples of subduction zones. Um, conducted the first dedicated seafloor microbiology work. It's only the last 20 years that we've come become really uh, cognizant of the importance of a huge uh, biomass, you know, micro <coughs> biota in the subsea pool. Uh, something I was involved in established about 20 select holes as long-term seismic or hydrological observatories. And moving on to IODP, which has had two different phases with the same acronym, but they changed what the, the, what the initials stood for in 2013. The first IODP was the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program. The second, the current one, is the International Ocean Discovery Program. That hopefully will last to 2023. All the uh, operators are undergoing right now uh, final stages of five-year renewals through 2023. They've been even more ambitious than DSDP or ODP with significantly greater international funding and th providing three types of scientific drilling platforms to the scientific community. Uh, the U.S. Have significantly upgraded the joint resolution. Here's the new version, blue hull, but all of this forward of, of that line forward is, has completely replaced and updated. Um, sailing out of Honolulu, there's Diamond Head there, and here's Japanese riser ship, which is constructed especially for this, shown near its home port, which has a beautiful view of Mount Fuji. And the Europeans provided mission-specific platforms, so-called MSPs, for places where JR or the Chiki cannot drill. Probably the best example is the very first MSP expedition to the Arctic in 2004, went very close to the North Pole. That was a three-ship operation. Here's the drilling platform, which had ice hard involved, but was not ice breaker status. The Swedish ice breaker Odin, and a Russian nuclear powered ice breaker to do the really heavy work. So, as you can imagine, that program is very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to switch to this the idea of long term borehole observatories. <clears throat> Important contribution of ODP and IODP since 1991, especially for understanding subsea floor hydrogeological processes and geohazards and fluid flow processes at subduction zones. There have been over 30 installed since 1991, including three just this year. Uh, one at Nankai, offshore Japan, and two in the last two months at Hikarei subduction zone offshore New Zealand. Um, and here's the initial concept. It was, we developed it, three of us, uh, Earl Davis, my friend, and myself, and Bob Carson, developed it uh, in a small town called Windeschessenbach, Germany, where we had uh, gathered together for an ODP panel meeting. Uh, we went out to dinner. This little small town had at least six or eight of its own breweries. So we engaged in some uh, sampling of the output of those breweries. <laughs> and then sketched out the concept on a dinner nap. So, 
not quite the same league as the uh, Moho wine breakfast, but it's equally fulfilling for the participants. <laughs> so this is one step beyond that dinner napkin sketch. Um, basically the concept was you put a plug in the top of the hole, you could suspend a data logger, and sensor string down in the hole, seal the hole, and you actually have a way of bringing the fluids up from the hole to some kind of a sampling dial at the seaport. It was originally we called it the instrumented borehole seal, which made sense to me. Um, but the drilling programs are very acronym happy. And the IBS acronym was already used four or five times. So we were told we had to come up with a different acronym. So we called it cork because this looks like a cork in the preserving your precious fluids in your wine bottle. Um, and and to reverse engineer what the acronym stood for. <laughs> Circulation obviation retrofit. <laughs> and we thought this was going to be a two or three year program, but it ended up being multi decades. Um, now there are many different models of these borehole uh, observatories, uh, from simple measurements like temperatures down in the hole and pressures. And now we have Osmo samples, which Miriam was instrumental in developing. Uh, for sampling the formation fluids to much more complicated uh, versions where you can seal multiple zones in a single hole, measure the pressures and sample those fluids separately. Um, and even in some cases, uh, like the LTBMS, that stands for long-term borehole monitoring system deployed from CHICU, um, they have very sophisticated downhole instrument packages, including broadband seismometers, tilt meters, strain meters, and they're connected to uh, fiber optic cable networks on the sea. So that's real-time data. There are three of them now off the, the Mankai Trough subduction zone. If you could figure out uh, the, the Japanese uh, web portal, you, anybody can find those data. <laughs> and there's one similar installation offshore Vancouver Island in the Cascade. So just a few pictures. This is one of the original corks. This is one in the middle of the Atlantic, in case you're driving around your sub and come upon something like this. Uh, here's one in the Northeast Pacific, uh, notable for a bunch of what looks like rust, but it's really microbial matter growing on the installation. Uh, that's an underwater variable ROV connector that allows us to get the downhole pressure data, which is being logged in this device that's being guarded by that female uh, octopus. <laughs> and we're lucky she's not very strong because those are the valves that control what signals are being fed to our data pool. <laughs> All right, here's an uh, animation of one of these. Basically, uh, there are three different 120 degree bays around the wellhead. Uh, in this particular case, there's one for fluid sampling microbiological sampling from down in the hole, and the pressure. <coughs> Some of those installations have downhole sensor strings that we need to recover periodically and replace. So we had to develop methods to do that with uh, submersible access. It was pretty easy to develop a method to pull the sensor string out, but putting a new one back in was a little more difficult. Starting in 2008, we were able to do that. Here's an example from the uh, Man Submersible Alvin in 2009. Basically, we're gonna, before Alvin goes in the water, we pre-deploy this 400 meter long sensor strip down to the seafloor uh, with a sinker bar and an extra drop weight and flotation up at the top of it so it stays vertical. And you have to balance your flotation and weights such that uh, when the sub comes and finds the bottom of it, and then it wants to release that extra heavy drop weight that is then only slightly negatively heavy so that the sub can actually pick it up, move it, and put it into the bowl. This is what's going to happen here. And the release from the drop weight. And then it's about 50 pounds heavy, the sub can pick it up, move it over into the top of the wellhead. And we want to 
moisture is heavier when we actually release it. So we go up to the top of the string, cut away some of the flotation, which is recovered from the ship, and then go back down, release it, and in it goes. And those are these Oswald samplers that we was instrumental with. And this is all on a, a spectral rope. That's spectral rope there. And there's a little product that we come along that has a temperature logger in it. And then you have to seal the top of the hole to make sure the experiment works properly. That's the top plug. <laughs> <laughs> it's in place. <laughs> all right. Now, actually, the capability to put instruments in the boreholes had been developed by another one of the most famous scripts luminaries, uh, Fred Spies, several years earlier. Um, and I had the honor to work with him in 2001 on the deployment of a wireline version of these core portable observatories in hole uh, 504B and 896A in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific. Uh, so this illustrates all the gear that we have to assemble over the side. Um, that's for those who might have known him, that's Gary Austin, who was a technician here at, at Scripps. Um, and here's Dr. Spies in 2001, uh, hands-on oceanographer like us all, in his hand with dirty, helping him in the deployment. Uh, so, and before we deploy this, we, we needed to collect video from down in the hole just to verify it was open. And so Fred was also instrumental in collecting what was the first video from within this mysterious second layer, the oceanic crust. And I think it might still be the only video. It's not routinely done from the drill ships because of the bandwidth issue. They can't get the video bandwidth up the logging conductor cables. Um, so this particular hole is in 34, 48 meters of water. It's got 175 meters of sediments. It's cased down to 195 meters, so into 16 meters into the basement. Uh, we only videoed about 50 meters of the, the basement. Um, so the video that I'm going to show you is begins just as we're exiting the casing. You'll see some uh, heavy material, which is actually the cement at the bottom of the casing, and then we get into the open. Um, the temperature log illustrated that there are three zones in the formation actually producing warm fluids up the borehole. And the video shows that these were associated with what we call particulate blooms, which is probably microbial matter being produced from within the oceanic crust. Anybody can get this and use it. Um, it's, it's available as an online supplement from EPSL from that particular part. So there's Fred Spies as the co, co PI with me. And this is maybe some of the first direct evidence of the importance of the subsea floor microbial class. Casing still there's the pebbly kind of a cement. And you can see that even that's coated with something, which is microbial. Now we're getting into open hole. You can see how the bit corkscrews down the hole as we drill. And you can start to see the boundaries between different pillow lava units that are forming the upper part of this second layer two, second layer it was called for mobile units. And the, the device is actually heating. The ship is heating, and so you will, it gets pulled back and goes back down again. But you can always, always see this particulate matter in the water. And as we get deeper, you can see some voids, especially on the right side, from which there seems to be producing this particulate matter. What's the diameter of the hole? Uh, that was drilled with a 97 8 fit, so it's probably 10, 12 inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is pretty confident formation here, but then as we get deeper, we 
will reach some, some basic washouts on the right side and those seem to be producing warm fluid that has lots of microbial matter. See the material in the water? <laughs> there. Anyway, the uh, temperature was about, it was approaching 65 degrees C at this point, and we need the video camera for operations after this, so Dr. Spies decided we had to stop. I want to block the whole hole, but I can. Anyway, so a few concluding slides here. Um, the drilling project has been especially important for acute science education and career development. I'm a perfect example. I sailed two expeditions as a graduate student. Uh, that made, the drilling program has made significant contributions to the graduate and postdoctoral educations of many leading geoscientists in both academia and industry. Uh, during IODP, the reach of this was extended to undergraduate participants on the drill ship and K-12 through education. So this is one of the most important accomplishments of scientific ocean drilling. A uh, perfect illustration was my own first graduate student, Amy Fisher, whose name has been heard a couple times. Uh, the day I started with the University of Miami was also the day I sailed on Lake 102 from Miami, and he joined me and he's, he's gone on to become co-chief scientist of a couple of expeditions and being one of the leading hydrogeologists in the world. So again, my message to the Scripps students here is if you ever get the chance to participate in IMDP, you really have to take it. It's two months at sea with an international group of scientists. It's an international academy. You, you develop contacts that will last all of your careers. All right. One last look back at DSTP. I guess Margaret is not here tonight. That's too bad. Well, um, these are the like 92 co chief scientists Dave Ray from the University of Michigan and Margaret Lyman, the current Scripps director. She was at URI at the time. Um, these t shirts are just, of course, they got along really well. Uh, but I want to point out, especially for the sake of the uh, women in, in geosciences uh, symposium tomorrow that Margaret was actually a real pioneer. She was the third of only three women co chief scientists in 96 DSTP lakes. So that's a pretty poor percentage. I think the first was Betty Bunce from Woods Hole with R.L. Fisher on lakes, like 24. Um, got a little better in ODP. There were 18 in 110 lakes. Uh, first IODP. At 12 and 48 expeditions, that was, that was getting better. Uh, Donna was one uh, on an expedition that had two women coaching scientists. Uh, second, IODP was doing better uh, to about uh, almost a third women coaching scientists. And in the last three years, there have been at least three examples of recent expeditions that not only had two women coaching scientists, but well over 50% of the scientific parties were women. And, and young, uh, young early career. So it's, again, uh, was it Chris you mentioned? Yeah. Yet in your opening talk today, uh, discussion. yeah, yeah, that there was one woman on this early, early expedition, and early, Ray. yeah, Helen Ray, and, and it was a, very much a male dominated. Uh, it was all male until yeah. she went. On right, the right. So the same is kind of the, true of the drilling program, but it's really much better. So, again, if you ever get the chance. We're all about a 48 is 25 percent. Uh, sorry, there are two coach chiefs, so there's it's actually 12 out of 96. So if you're trying to verify my math, yeah. double. <laughs> No, really. So it says expeditions, but there are two on almost certain. There have been a few with just one. There's also been a few with half expeditions. Yeah. So I just wanted to provide that information for the uh, Women in Chief Sciences uh, Symposium tomorrow. And one of my friends sent me this silly cartoon from the New Yorker. And hopefully we won't be sitting at my office conversations anymore. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Just about. I do have another video ready to show if anybody's interested. But uh, I was only supposed to take an hour. <laughs> And this right here is a microscope. 
But I also, I mean, the seismologists conducted their survey at 504B after the hole had penetrated uh, that deep. And there's always a question, you know, refraction seismology has an averaging scale, and how do you compare that to, to results from a single bore? Single bore I guess at those depths, the averaging scale is a few hundred meters, right? So. Yeah. The other, the other, the 1250-60D, the hole has actually reached Gavros, but the seismic uh, resolution of the layer 2-3 boundary is a few hundred meters below that. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, I'll take out the hot seat here and then <laughs> fill in as a moderator. We lost our student group a little bit. But anyway, thanks so much, Karen. That was, that was great. And uh, thanks, everybody, today. Tomorrow we start, Sheeta, when do we start tomorrow? Is it 9 o'clock again tomorrow? Yes. So, and back here, there's some breakfast or kind of food and coffee beforehand at 8.30 starting. So, look forward to seeing you.